So, hi everybody, thank you so much for coming today um, to our third and final fall quarter brown bag lunch discussion series for the month of March. Uh, I'm thrilled to introduce Rebecca Ferreira. She'll be speaking on the philosophy of civil disobedience. Um, again, there's a sign in the sheet going around, and I'll mail them to your teachers. Um, and just so a heads up for winter quarter, uh, we have a visitor coming January 17th. His name is Planet King. He's a documentary filmmaker and I think amateur historian or historian. Um, and he's going to be presenting a film and discussion program. His film is called Passage at St. Augustine, the 1964 Black Lives Matter movement that transformed America. It's about um, a battle in St. Augustine, Florida, that was part of the Civil Rights Movement and helped move along the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Um, so he's, he's uh, created a documentary about that. It's pretty amazing. Um, and then what he does is he'll, he discusses history and also civil rights issues in the African-American community and in the United States as a whole now, makes connections between the two. Um, so anyway, that's January 17th, and we from 1 to 3 in the afternoon, location to be announced. Um, and then hopefully we'll, we have a few other films also happening in winter quarter. So there'll be more on that. But yeah, thank you for coming. And again, for those of you just walking in, there's a sign-in sheet going around. And if it missed you, we'll circulate it again at the end. Thanks. Thank you, Jody. Yeah, you're welcome. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for coming and spending your time here today. Um, I am going to be talking to you, obviously, about the philosophy of civil disobedience. Uh, we're going to focus on three questions, but more so than just me telling you what famous philosophers and thinkers have said, I really want to also get you to think about what these topics mean to you. And so we're going to be looking at three primary questions uh, throughout this talk today, and I'll be breaking up each one. Um, so you will be talking to those next to you, so maybe if you're not currently sitting next to someone, maybe you want to scooch over, introduce yourself uh, to someone nearby, maybe groups of two or three, uh, that you can talk uh, some of your ideas through. Next to somebody? <laughs> So, um, as Jenny mentioned, my name is Rebecca. Um, I teach philosophy and gender studies here at Green River College, um, and the topic of civil disobedience is one that I think is greatly important, um, probably throughout all of human history, but obviously in this day and age as well. So we're going to be looking at three questions today. Um, throughout this talk, and as I mentioned, you will be hopefully discussing these ideas with those close to you. The first question we're going to ask is, what makes a breach of law an act of civil disobedience? There are lots of different ways one could break a law, right, that might not have the same motivation or reasons behind it as an act of civil, civil disobedience. Um, and as we'll talk through with uh, the third question, they might also deserve different kinds of punishment, right, depending on those motivations. So we'll talk specifically what is unique about acts of civil disobedience as opposed to other forms of law breaking. Second, once we have an idea of what civil disobedience is, we want to ask under what conditions is it morally justifiable, right, because we typically don't always think that we have good reasons, right, to break the law. So if civil disobedience is one of those cases, under what specific criteria could we be justified in breaking those laws? And then finally, once those laws are broken, how do we think law enforcement ought to respond, right? Given the unique circumstances under which civil disobedience occurs and the unique motivations which can spot, uh, spawn those acts, how do we think police officers, right, the um, court system, right, should respond to those uh, acts of law breaking? So we'll be addressing all of these uh, questions and using lots of examples throughout history as well as today. Um, to kind of get a sense of what these acts entail. So uh, the first one I start off with, right, <laughs> is an example of a U.S. Marine Corps veteran, as well as many others, who were uh, arrested in front of the White House while they were protesting the traditional don't ask, don't tell rule in, um, in the military, right? So the idea that we shouldn't openly allow our people, allow people to serve openly um, as gay, right, or lesbian individuals. And so one of the reasons I picked this example was to show that not all acts of civil disobedience are taken on by those you would assume, right? So even members of our democracy, right, of our government could engage in acts of civil disobedience, right? 
It's not all going to be the lefty, hippie, dippy types, <laughs> right? As much as we will see some of those as well, right? All individuals, right, could be open to committing acts of supremacy. So to give you a general sense of what civil disobedience is and where it comes from, um, we can understand it to be the notion that an individual has a certain sort of responsibility to disobey a law in the state when some other superior ideal overrides that law. So what I mean by this is that we typically understand there to be a difference between the laws that humans think right, that we enact in our states and our governments, and then also notions of morality or some higher notions of right or wrong, right? So just because something might be a law doesn't necessarily mean it's right, and just because something violates a law doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong. So we understand these things to often be at odds with one another, or at least um, at minimum they might be morally neutral, right? So you might not think you have a moral imperative to wear your seatbelt, right? But we have laws about such things. Um, and certainly we have had laws in the past that we now view as morally reprehensible, right? We did not think that following those laws was the right thing to do, or vice versa, right? So we see a, dis a, a distinction here between human laws and maybe some superior ideals that we have. And this brings up a really important relationship or question about the relationship between individuals and the states they operate in, right? What sort of responsibility do you have as a citizen right, to the state, to the authority, and what sort of responsibilities do they have to you as their citizens, right? So these are some of the things that will be brought up in our discussion. Um, and another notion that comes across in many fingers throughout history is that humans are unique in that we have the capacity to reason through right and wrong. And so if we come up against a law that we think conflicts with our morality, then perhaps human reason can dictate how we should respond in that situation, right? So these laws are open to assessment, right, and critique and reflection, and humans have the capacity to engage in that sort of reflection, right? Um, the one thing that is gonna be unique about acts of civil disobedience as opposed to other forms of law breaking is the part that makes it quote unquote civil. <laughs> and this part is really important, and it involves the person engaging in law breaking <coughs> is doing so under the expectation that they will be punished for that act, right? So this is gonna be different from violating laws in secret, right, or doing so and um, kind of fighting back, right, or resisting the forms of punishment that might follow from that law breaking, right? So that's gonna, it's not just disobedience, right, so the civil part is gonna be very important. So throughout history, right, this is just a few of the many examples that we can find of uh, very now infamous individuals who have engaged in acts of what we might consider civil disobedience. So to start off, we have uh, Susan B. Anthony, who at the time, as a woman, was not legally permitted to vote and was thus arrested for attempting to vote. We have Martin Luther King Jr., who engaged in a number of boycotts and protests, right, against racial segregation. Uh, we have Mahatma Gandhi, right, who also engaged in a number of protests and strikes for various civil rights issues. Uh, Henry David Thoreau, uh, probably most infamous because he wrote, right, uh, civil disobedience. Um, and his act was um, uh, maybe a little bit more mild than the others in that he refused to pay his taxes, right, because those taxes would go to fund slavery and wars that he opposed. Um, Nelson Mandela, again, a number of strikes and protests against apartheid, and Rosa Parks, right, breaking the law by refusing to give up her seat, right, to a white individual and sitting in the back of the bus. Right, so most of us are probably familiar with these examples. We also have contemporary or modern examples, right, of individuals breaking the law in what we might consider to be acts of civil disobedience. So um, this, I'm not sure if you can see this, but up here we have a picture of a large group of individuals who are laying down in the middle of the street blocking traffic. They did so to uh, draw attention to the AIDS epidemic. Um, we have Malala Yousafzai, right, who was not permitted to go to school, right, in her country, and so in attempting to go to school was breaking the law. We have um, ALF, or the Animal Liberation Front, who is notorious for breaking into our animal labs and research institutions to free the animals, right? Um, we have uh, 
Occupy Wall Street, which I'm sad to say most of my students already don't remember this. <laughs> wasn't that long ago. Um, where we had a number of individuals who also occupied both public and private land, right, to protest various um, behaviors from those in Wall Street. And then most recently, right, we have also, again, people refusing to pay their taxes, both during the time of the Vietnam War and today, right? This has happened for lots of different reasons, but most recently it has been to protest the current administration in the United States, all for two reasons. One, uh, because the uh, current president has refused to release his own tax returns, and also because, like Henry David Thoreau, there is some concern about the use of our taxes, right? What sorts of things they're being fund they're used to fund. So these are a number of examples, again, throughout history and today of acts of civil disobedience. So before we get into what, again, famous thinkers have thought about what makes these acts specifically uh, civilly disobedient, I want you to take a moment to think about what features these acts have in common. Right? So take a moment to think about these examples, and maybe perhaps you know some others, and talk to the person next to you about what sorts of things they all share in common which might make them acts of civil disobedience as opposed to other forms of law breaking. So take a minute, talk to someone next to you, maybe you want to write something down, and we're gonna, I'm going to ask you to share those. No, I, I would agree. Yeah. 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 Yes, right. Good, so that's one of the things that we're going to talk about and when we talk about nonviolence is what specifically counts as violence, right? Do we mean violence against ourselves, other people, or property damage, right? Because certainly the latter seems to be occurring in the case of the Animal Liberation Front. But yes, most of these, right, if not all of them, have the commonality of nonviolence, right? So that is going to be one of the integral features of civil disobedience. Any other ideas about what they have in common? Exactly. And any sense about what that point might be? Or a shared sort of point we're trying to make? Like the typically it's like the point of rights of like whether it be human rights or uh, whether it be animal rights, like in the case of ALF or whether it's just like what to consider right the law, like what's more than what's not. Very good, right? So we certainly seem to be fighting for someone's rights, right? Whether it's the rights of certain groups of human beings, all of human beings, right? Animals in this case as well, perhaps. We could also think of examples of tree hugging, right? To protect the environment, good, good. And then yeah, it certainly ties with our sense of morality, right? What we think is right or wrong. Yeah? Um, like, compared to like, lawbreaking, I feel like lawbreaking a lot of times it's for, like in the individual, like these like, acts for like the general public. Excellent. All of these acts take place in public, right? They're going to be out in the open. We're going to talk about why that's a very important feature. Any other ideas about what they share? Yes. When you're looking at the rights part, but if you look at the animals and human beings, it's the actual punishment that some of these receive. So you talk about nine lives, but some of these people are being as a result of their civil disobedience? Yeah, good, right? So we see that sort of shared acceptance or willingness to accept or expect some sort of punishment. Good. I saw a hand up here. No. Okay. Any other ideas? Yes. The refusal to submit to a minor rule um, in, in order to protest the. Um, Injustice of a larger rule. Very good. So the, some key ideas there is that it certainly has to do, and maybe with that point or motive, right, that we're talking about, some call to an injustice that is happening, right? So when a viol uh, rights are being violated, right, or, or something is being done that is morally impermissible, right? These are can be seen as acts of injustice in that they're not fair, right? They're not equitable in some way. And also the idea that they have to break a law, right? So they are going to be breaking some law. Right, to make that point, right, that they're trying to get across. Good. And this is actually, I was just telling Jody one of the reasons why I did not include Colin Kaepernick as one of my examples, because uh, while many 
consider his recent protest to be one of civil disobedience, he's not actually breaking a law, right? Which we're actually going to see is quite significant, right, to the act of civil disobedience. Good. So, uh, congratulations, you're all philosophers. <laughs> you have all come up, right, with some defining features of what makes certain actions civilly disobedient. So I'm going to give you a list here that comes primarily from Henry David Thoreau as well as John Rawls, right? And these are things that typically we locate in acts of civil disobedience. So first off, it is a law-breaking act, right? There is some law, an official law, that is being broken. Um, and as I'm going to show you in a second, this can be directly or indirectly. But the first thing that philosophers want to see or thinkers want to see in an act of civil disobedience is that it is conscientious law breaking, which means that you are breaking it for a particular reason, right? There is some principle that you have, whether moral, political, or social, that you think is more important than the law that you are breaking, right? So that sort of comparison, again, between superior ideals and human laws. We also want the actions to be politically motivated and thus intended to change something, right? So the act should be done not only to draw attention, right, to some issue that you locate in your, your governance, but also it should have the intent to make a change, right? We don't want to just continue to see these injustices occur. We want some sort of change to result as, um, from the action, right? And specifically the drawing attention of that action. So your protest or your act of civil disobedience is supposed to communicate that message, right? You're communicating exactly what the injustice is, as well as what sort of change you would like to see come about. And this was actually one of the problems with um, the Occupy Wall Street movement, is that while the target of injustice was made quite clear, what specific changes were wanted, were, uh, the individuals wanted to see done were not made. So it was difficult to figure out how to respond right, to that sort of protest. Well, what exactly are you asking us for, right? How can we respond and make things better? How can we alleviate this sort of injustice? So that sort of response needs to be made clear as well. And this leads to the fourth condition or a feature of civil disobedience, which I mentioned before, is that it has to be made in public. Now, this is a tricky one because, of course, with certain acts of lawbreaking, the message you're trying to get across might be undone or undermined if you give, say, law enforcement fair notice ahead of time, right? So for example, in the case of breaking into a research laboratory, you probably don't want to let police know that you're going to be doing that ahead of time, right? Because they would be able to arrest you or stop you, right? Impede you from getting that act across. So philosophers have been um, somewhat flexible with this criterion in that it just has to be public at some point. This can occur after the act has taken place during the act itself or beforehand. But as long as that message is made clear, right, the, uh, the act of civil disobedience is intact. And as was mentioned numerous times, it must be nonviolent. And it's not necessarily clear why this must be the case, because as we've probably seen throughout history, acts of violence can affect change, right? They can have huge impacts. So why is it that an act of civil disobedience shouldn't be violent? Well, for thinkers like Thoreau and Rawls, it's because you're trying to achieve justice, right? You're trying to achieve some sort of social good, right, as a result of your action. So the idea is that if you engage in violence, you're risking the effect of that social good actually taking place, either because you're undermining the very sense of justice you're trying to fight for, or because it can risk antagonizing people who might support you. Right? So people who might otherwise be sympathetic to your message might be turned off if they see you going about using violence to achieve those ends. Right? So it's both a conceptual right, or principled reason for nonviolence as well as a pragmatic one. Right? We might, it might not be the most effective method right, to utilize violence. Finally, as I mentioned before, all acts of civil disobedience should be accompanied by an expectation right, or at least acceptance of potential arrest and punishment, right? So this involves not, again, just how the police are gonna to respond to the act itself, but also what might follow from the court system, right? Whether it's being charged or sentenced in a particular way, and we're gonna talk about how we think that might go. Are there any questions about these features of civil disobedience? Yes. I've 
I'm looking at the public one, and I'm wondering if there's any situations where like the media might actively block making it public. So I mean, you're, this is a very kind of counter hegemonic activity. But what if hegemony blocks making public? That? That's what I'm asking. Good. And this has actually been a reason why some people have tried to re-examine this criteria. Right? Is that the idea is that if the goal is to get public attention and you are fighting against those in power, right, then certainly we might not be able to achieve the sort of public attention that we desire if we go about traditionally legal means or if we go about it through nonviolent protests. Too quiet, right? People are not as interested, right? We for better or for worse, humans tend to be drawn to violence, right? Seems to perk our attention. Right? So this might be a reason to reformulate that. But the idea is that um, we need to make it public regardless of how the media is going to skew that message. And this was actually specifically said by John Rawls, is that we have to get the message out there even at risk of that message being changed or twisted into something else. Right? Better that people be talking about the issue even in the wrong way right, than not be discussing it at all. And so it is up to those engaging in the action to try to be as effective in their messaging as possible. Right? But you kind of have to, once you put it out there, you kind of do have to be open to the fact that people are going to take it in different ways. Right? You cannot control how people receive that message. Um, but it's exactly that sort of dialogue that is supposed to be part of the change you're enacting. Right? Any other questions? Well, yeah. Um, if they are afraid of the punishment part, if, uh, if like breaking into like the animal labs, using mm -hmm. that for example. Um, if they don't get caught, would be considered, like if they wear a mask, they make it public, make a video of them releasing them, but they're wearing masks and they're getting caught, would that be considered law breaking or that be still considered civil disobedience? Good, right? So one could very well make the case that because they're hiding their identities, they're not in fact being as public as they ought to be. And so that might disqualify them, right, from uh, being considered an act of civil disobedience. But if they are willing to accept arrest and um, perhaps jail time, right, as a result, if they were to be caught, right, it's not necessarily that the goal is to be arrested, although sometimes that could be the case, because then you can sort of turn yourself into a bit of a martyr, right, for that message. Sometimes people want to be arrested, right, it makes more of a stance than uh, if they, you know, get away with it. <laughs> but um, as long as you're willing to accept the punishment that is handed down, um, and from, the little I know of the Animal Liberation Front, I don't think that they fight the charges that often, right? But they do tend to keep their identity secret. Yeah. So you really point out that you get caught Exactly, right? It's part of that effective messaging. Yeah. 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 Yes. So, uh, that's something that can be done with, with the public, but what happens when like, the media kind of portrays it as violent acts? So, like, that's been like a common with the recent protests. I know certain ones have been portrayed. <coughs> as being very violent, but uh, like media is as reliable as it used to be. So it could so it could still be justified as like a civil disobedience even if like how it's being publicly displayed shows it being violent. Good and yeah that's kind of what I was saying is that the violence or nonviolence aspect is up for debate, right? Not all of the thinkers who discuss civil disobedience agree that the approach needs to be nonviolent, especially because it can be more effective. Um, but yeah, the messaging, again, is not really in the control of the actor, right? It's going to be up to the public, right, to kind of sort through those things. And this is one of the things we're going to talk about when we get to how law enforcement responds, right? In that um, if you act violently, you're pretty much making it mandatory that the police have to respond with some sort of force, right? So nonviolence can also be strategic in that you are open to less criticism um, if the police decide to use force, right? People are more likely to say it's not justified if you weren't violent. But of course, if you were being violent and the police respond with force, then they were obviously permitted to do so, right? So yeah, there is a bit of strategy and a sort of risk involved, absolutely. Any other questions about these features? So as I mentioned before, one of the other things to consider is that Acts of civil disobedience can be direct or indirect. And what I mean by this is that the law you're breaking may or may not necessarily be the law you are in resistance to, right? Or that you're trying to change. So an example of direct 
disobedience, right, would be when you are breaking the law that you actually want to see changed. So for example, down here, um, many of you may know of this, right, um, at Woolworth, right, a number of men of color who sat at the lunch counter even though they were not to be served, right, it was against uh, their, the segregation and um, the Jim Crow laws as well as the policy of that business, right, establishment, right, so they were directly disobeying the law that they were in protest of, right, they were, di they were disobeying it because they had issues with racial segregation. Whereas an instance of indirect civil disobedience would be the occupying of public or private land at Standing Rock to oppose the installation of the pipeline, right? So in this case, you're not breaking the law of the pipeline, right? You're breaking some other law, in this case, occupying land in order to protest a different law, right? So again, acts of civil disobedience can be direct in breaking the law you're trying to protest, or you can break a different law right, to bring a text in to a different issue. But again, no matter what they are, right, they're traditionally understood as nonviolent and also not legal, right? So this is supposed to be different from other forms of resistance, such as legal protesting, right? You can get a permit, you can occupy public space, and you can voice your dissent and not actually break any laws, right? There are also more drastic acts of violence, such as radical protests or revolutionary actions, which have different goals, right? They're either used to, uh, motivated by instilling fear or changing an entire regime of government, whereas acts of civil disobedience are understood to be a little bit more focused, right? You're kind of aiming yourself at a particular issue or a particular law within a governing body. So this leads us to our next question. Now that we have a sense of what civil disobedience is, I would like you to think about when you think it's morally permissible to engage in an act of civil disobedience. So take a minute to talk to someone next to you and think under what circumstances would you be permitted to break a law in a civilly disobedient way? <laughs> when do we think it might be okay to engage in civil disobedience? Want to share? Yes. When your actions don't reflect negatively on other people, or like there's no comp or your consequences of your actions don't hurt other people. Like at all, or more so than the law you're breaking? More so. Uh, I don't know, I didn't think about it that far. No problem. So we want some sort of, at least not negative, in yeah. maybe even positive consequences. Good. Right, so there's supposed to be something good that comes out of it. Yeah. Rob? Is it kind of the same thing that you said, like, um, if you commit a lot of it's causing more harm than good? Good, right? So, in cases where we really are taking issue with a harmful law, right? We're protecting one's property. Any others? Yes. Good. Standing for something bigger than yourself, which goes to that principled stand, right? There's the risk that you're taking on is really considered minimal when you think of the larger effect. Uh, I think we should always be able to break the law and uh, extend from what you think is right, even if it is just to show other people like another another way to a specific point. Okay, so uh, anytime an act, a law is immoral. Yeah. You think? Anytime you think the law is immoral. Okay. Yes. Um, I feel like the. The act you are doing should be less harmful than the law itself. So. Good, so positive results or the law needs to be more harmful yeah. than the act of breaking it? Yeah. Okay. I feel like if like, the majority of like, the public agrees that the law is like, wrong, Interesting. Like some people like 
maybe we have some people don't want to act up, so. So you think we actually need the majority to be kind of on board? Yeah, I don't, you don't need it, but it's like, I think it could be one of the components. Could be one of them? It doesn't, okay. it doesn't have to be majority, like, rule, like, if majority agrees, you can still, it can still be okay, even though the majority doesn't agree. That could be one of the components that really does that. Any other ideas when it's permissible? It's something about basic human rights are being uh, denied. I'm thinking about indirect civil disobedience. So, and just kind of laws that are set up to prevent or punish people who want to gather to protest something. So, when the law is there to um, squelch protests. So, we tend to associate the right to gather for protest with democracy. So, if the law kind of contradicts something democratic. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> Any other ideas? Good, so this is a really great list and is actually far more exhaustive than the conditions that um, some of the thinkers have set out. So actually there are um, five conditions, according to John Rawls, under which he thinks it is morally permissible to engage in acts of civil disobedience. And the first one is actually uh, goes against what we had up on our list, which is that it cannot be any time you have an issue with the law, right? So Rawls thinks that if we were to engage or permit acts of civil disobedience any time you take issue with the law, this would actually create greater harm to society, right? And would actually undermine the notions of democracy that we're trying to uphold when we stand, right, against an unjust law. So if the goal is to bring about some social good, always breaking the law is probably not gonna do that. So he's gonna say that it's only morally permissible in cases of clear and substantial forms of injustice, right? So really things that go against our sense of what is fair, what is equitable, and what lends itself to a social good, right? And so he thinks these, this is going to make civil disobedience or permissible civil disobedience quite rare. And that that should be a good thing, right? Because we probably shouldn't have it as our first resort, right? In fact, this leads into the second condition. It should be our very last resort, meaning that we should exhaust all legal means of trying to change the problematic law before we resort to law breaking. Right? Because again, if the goal is to make society better, make it stronger, and achieve some social good, then if we just resort to breaking the law right away, we're not really going to achieve that end. Right? So we should exhaust all legal means. Um, but he does acknowledge that, of course, acts of civil disobedience most often occur because those in positions of power are unlikely to be swayed right, to change the law through legal channels. So he says that if you, you don't necessarily have to have gone through all of the legal options, if you look back and you see that others have tried to do so with no positive effect, then if you can say that if I try, it would pretty much be a waste of my time, right? Because I've seen how those in power respond to these requests, right? They're immovable, they're, they're not empathetic, right, to our pleas then you can resort to civil disobedience. But there has to have been some effort, right, to change it through the legal channels of democracy. And the third condition is really interesting. He thinks that since minority groups are the most likely to engage in actions, uh, acts of civil disobedience, you are obligated to try to coordinate with them if there is time. Because he thinks that if various minority groups are trying to achieve the same ends, but not working together, you're less likely to be effective. And you might actually end up undermining each other's efforts, right? So you should do the work of trying to figure out who else has a vested interest in this change that you're trying to affect and coordinate with them. And this leads to the next one, which is that, again, the reason we wanna do this coordination is because it's more likely to result in a successful change, right? And he actually thinks that we only should act uh, civilly disobedient in cases where we're likely to succeed. And this is probably the point that most people disagree on, right? Because many think that 
we're most morally justified in being civil disobedient when things are really bad, <laughs> right? When there is perhaps no chance of achieving change through legal channels because maybe the people in power are so corrupt, right, and so unjust that it will their your pleas will always fall on deaf ears. But he thinks that since it's supposed to achieve a social good, we should try to make it at least more likely than not that it will affect change. And then finally, we should balance the harm that could come about through breaking the law right, with the harm of the law, which a lot of you took into account, right? We want positive results, we want to only address harmful laws, we want to make sure that the law itself is more harmful than breaking the law, so a lot of you picked up on this last point, right, which is that we want to make sure that we're doing less harm by breaking the law than if we were to leave the law in place. And this is really important for the last part of our talk, about how law enforcement should respond because one of the strong cases for not responding with force to people who are engaging in acts of civil disobedience is that police might actually be more likely to create harm if the people are behaving non-violently and the police respond with force they're actually more likely to create a less safe environment right because if the police respond with force other people then get upset right, and respond negatively to that, right? So there is a concern about public safety, right, a, a concern about creating the best social good. So for the sake of time, um, I'm going to move on to the last question. Are there any questions about these conditions? So now we have a sense of what civil disobedience is, when it's morally justifiable. So now I would like you to think, how should law enforcement respond to actors who are being civil disobedient? And to be more specific, do you think they should respond the same to actors who are civilly disobedient as to other people who break the law? Should they respond differently? And if they should respond differently, should they respond with more or less force right, than they would to someone who is just breaking the law? Right. So talk with someone close to you about how you think law enforcement should respond. So again, if we're comparing acts of civil disobedience to ordinary acts of law breaking, right, how do we think law enforcement should respond? This right here is almost a catch-22. It depends on how the law enforcement is responding. If it's a white officer responding or if it's a minority responding, how is each law enforcement officer going to take it? Good, and so we certainly are going to bring up uh, the tendency to respond different ways to people of different color, right? However, we do also want to note that when we talk about what we should do, right, that might not necessarily match up with what people actually do, right? And so, yeah, we might be talking about things that might never affect the way law enforcement does respond, but we are trying to set a moral standard for how we think they ought to respond. But you're right that perhaps it depends, right? It depends on the person or the situation. Other ideas about how law enforcement should respond? Yes. I, I thought that if, as long as no person is being physically harmed and no property is being physically harmed, escalating to harming the protesters is too much. I mean, it, it's a public disturbance at that point. But on the same side of it, I mean, when the, uh, oh, what was it, in, was it Charlotte's, Charlottesville or Charlotte? Charlottesville? The uh, white supremacist rally, like, their their words and their voices and uh, what they were, their message was very harmful. But if you censor words you don't like to hear, then how is that to stop law enforcement or the politicians from censoring all words they don't want to hear. So it's it's not it's kind of a catch-22. It's like, at what point do you say, all right, stop? But at the same time, it's, it's a public disturbance, and it's meant to be an irritation and to make people stop and pay attention. Good. So if we're not experiencing cases of physical harm, right, then we might say that the officers should respond maybe less with less force, right, than they would for ordinary law breaking. Okay. 
feel like we should still go by the book. I don't, I don't feel like it should be more for less force. Okay. I feel because like if somebody like is laying in a highway for protesting, you're gonna have to remove them for their safety and then you know the traffic on and stuff like that. And then also if you're trying you have to remove them like, you know, peacefully, you know. But then if they're resisting arrest and you're not accepting the punishment, so that's then like that's like force from there. But I feel like if you make the, the law enforcement trying to peacefully remove them from an area that's causing a disturbance, that's fine. So we want maybe the same sort of response from law enforcement, whether it's an ordinary act of law breaking or an act of civil disobedience, but of course, should the individual resist arrest or give them some reason to use force? Okay. This is more of a question. Our roommates were very conflicted on the subject. Um, one of them said less force would be okay if they're not violent. Like it's already written up there, and other said that could affect the desired outcome because if there's not, if people aren't seeing the force being used, then they might not really want to make, you know, want to actually make a difference. If that makes sense. Like, uh, so if people don't see police brutality, uh, then they're see, less likely to support the protesters. Maybe not, not like that. More like um, during the civil rights movement, you see the pictures so, of. Police using canines, fire hoses, and stuff like that. That really kind of it, it wasn't right, but it showed kind of the will that people had to, to make a difference. But I'm not. I'm not saying that they should use more or less force in this. Oh, so the right. idea is that the amount of force shown by the law enforcement kind of mirrors the s significance of the yeah. law being broken. And I just juxtapose this perfectly, like. Putting another issue the ones they're protesting. So maybe we don't want to phrase that as the same as ordinary law breaking, but we want police officers to match sort of the severity. Sure. Right? Okay. Um, can I add on to that? I, I think that if you look at the conflicts that may have the world views, they're pretty much all violent. Um, so I think if you want to get your point across, like across the world, you probably want the police to be extremely violent in order to kind of show. So maybe we want we want more force because it brings more attention. Yeah, I mean it's okay. not good for civil disobedience, so it's probably good in order to get your point across. Okay. Other ideas. Like this idea of a deterrent. I mean, that's the point of the law enforcement community is to deter future action. I'm assuming, potentially. So, from their perspective, then, if they do less or the same as they would do for any other act of breaking the law, is that enough of a deterrent? So, I don't agree that it should be more, but I'm wondering through their lens if that's why it's more a lot of times, because they're wanting to get a really clear, a, a clear line in the sand that says no more of this. And maybe that also depends on the situation, right? So maybe, it, depending on the situation, law enforcement should respond however necessary to deter the continuation or future acts, okay? <coughs> Any other ideas? Um, I agree that activism, so I've seen this uh, civil resistance. And like what I understand is like law like a lot of things that are like, 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 like I don't think that's true like no matter what they're gonna do there to protect the system that they're fighting against. And so like I think if anything there's like a call within the law enforcement itself of where they have been shown to be successive force when it's not needed. And so like I feel like they should they're in a position where they need to be like like they need to be consistent. Like they need to be like the same. The same um, between all actors of civil disobedience or between all lawbreakers in general? Like, I guess I can all, like, lawbreakers in general because it gives them shown to, like, favor different races and different races. Great, so we want the same between civil, civilly disobedient agents and any ordinary <coughs> But we also want consistency, right? Oh, maybe looking at uh, 
it differently. Maybe uh, I remember seeing a picture of a police officer hugging a little girl that kind of went viral on the internet, and he got apparently got in trouble for it because he was it was during a protest. So maybe uh, police officers were more friendly, I guess. So again, maybe we want less force, more friendly behavior. Okay, for the sake of time, I know people are probably heading off to the next class. I want to show you some considerations, um, and I actually got this from a member of law enforcement, right? Um, and this was a paper written specifically to address the lack of training that law enforcement typically receive when going to handle instances of protest or civil disobedience. Right now, we want to consider what the reason for having laws and law enforcement is, right? So we need to first acknowledge that laws are a form of compromise, right? We are giving up certain freedoms that we would otherwise have in order for what we assume to be a greater public good, right? So we should acknowledge the role of law to begin with, and actors of civil disobedience aren't against all laws in general, right? We're only against the unjust laws, right, at least as we've seen civil disobedience here. And of course, you know, constantly breaking laws and constantly undermining authority, right, certainly could weaken the very democratic system, right, that we're trying to improve, right? So that is a consideration. Um, also, if civilly disobedient acts are occurring all the time, we could imagine that this could increase crime, right, because as we've seen, part of what might change the message that certain actors are trying to get across is when other people who are not really on board with the principled approach come in and kind of wreak havoc, right? So this has happened during a number of protests where the protest was supposed to be nonviolent, but then you get a group of people who show up, cause trouble, and then they kind of get center stage, right? Kind of gives them permission to act in very unruly ways that maybe weren't intended, right? Um, we could also see this notion of permitting civil disobedience as a sort of permission of anarchy, right? We can decide when to follow the rules of law and when not to, right? Which kind of switches the role of power, perhaps in a way that, again, could undermine the system we're trying to improve. Um, I mentioned that it's susceptible to sub uh, subversive infiltration. Um, acts of, civilly disobe of civil disobedience could encroach on the rights of others, right? Uh, you mentioned protecting one's private property, right? So they could involve the conflict of rights. Um, we know that this is supposed to be a last resort, which means there typically are other legal alternatives to civil disobedience. Um, and one of the things is that sometimes we assume that the role of law enforcement is not really to render their own moral judgment, right? Of all the things we think they're supposed to be doing, we don't necessarily ascribe to them the responsibility of casting judgment on the people that they come across, right? They're supposed to be objective. They're not supposed to be making their own judgments in this case. And then finally, we've already noted that civilly disobedient individuals are already supposed to accept the punishment, right, of their actions. So assuming that law enforcement responds in kind should be also accepted, right? So these are some considerations as we think of how law enforcement should respond. However, having said that, right, we, we need to acknowledge the responsibility on the part of law enforcement. For one, we need to acknowledge that even though they have a right to enforce laws, they also have a perhaps arguably bigger obligation towards public safety. And as I mentioned before, responding with more excessive force than the civilly disobedient actors are engaging in could actually undermine the very public safety you're trying to protect. So we need to acknowledge that while they're doing their job, they do have certain discretionary power, right? They do have to make decisions all the time, and they do have the decision to let some infractions go. Right? They don't, in fact, enforce every law-breaking incident. Right? They are constantly letting things go. And I don't think most people would want to live in a society where every single law was constantly being enforced. Right? We constantly like the sort of like warning, <laughs> right? Have a conversation, let's just disperse, right? We don't, we don't have to resort to arrest or these sorts of things that might actually be called for by the law, right? And if we understand that the dissenters have other options available to them, then certainly law enforcement have other options available to them as well, besides simply result or resorting to use of force. 
So one of the things that um, this one law enforcement uh, officer called for is more specific criteria set ahead of time, right? Under what specific circumstances are we going to begin arresting people, right? And the traditional line in the minimal literature there is, is that, as you mentioned, should only be in cases where the people who are dissenting are threatening public safety, right? So when they are engaging in acts of physical harm, and this doesn't even always involve property damage, right? So they call this view extreme tolerance, right? So police enforcement, right, law enforcement is uh, under some circumstances expected to let minor infractions go as long as they don't threaten people's safety. One of the other things that they need to acknowledge, especially in this day and age with social media and everybody you know, having their camera phones, is that when you respond, perhaps with greater force right, than is called for by the situation, that is going to perhaps reinforce the message that those civilly disobedient actors are trying to get across. right? You are making them martyrs. You are giving them the upper hand because now you have responded in a disproportionate sort of way. right? And so perception matters, right? We live in a world where that's gonna play a very important role. And you even mentioned, even in cases where police officers maybe do the right thing, right? Perception very often can, can shape the way that conversation goes. So again, enforcing the law is not and should not be the only goal of law enforcement, right? They have bigger goals, right? And those might overshadow, right, the minor infractions that are taking place during acts of civil disobedience. But if someone were to be arrested, right, we might then ask what sorts of punishment are appropriate. And just real quick, I'm going to talk about three different views of punishment that are seen to, uh, as a potential way of responding to acts of civil disobedience. The first one is just desserts, right? You give, you treat it kind of just like any other law-breaking incident, and you give them a punishment that is proportional to the severity of their action, right? So basically, you get what you deserve. One form that is, uh, as Julie brought up, is perhaps more extensive than what the individual actually deserves would be a deterrence theory of punishment, where you give them whatever punishment will deter them and future people from breaking that law again. But this can go above and beyond what the person actually deserves, right? Because you're kind of trying to send a message. And then finally, a less severe approach is called the communicative approach, right, to punishment where you try to show mercy to the individual as long as they repent, right, and reform and promise not to do it again, right? And so then you can be more lenient, right, in your punishment, so they don't quite get what they deserve, but the reason that they do that is because they've kind of undermined their message, right, that they were trying to put forth in the first place, because they're kind of stepping back a little bit. So I want to thank you all for attending. Um, I'm happy to hang around if you have more questions, but I hope you will continue to think critically about the kinds of things you see in politics and society, and maybe even take a philosophy class. I right, have a great day.